Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for this uh, short introduction. And thank you, uh, WSO2, for giving us this uh, opportunity to share our customer story, API-driven integration with WSO2 uh, at Schneider Electric. So before I start uh, deep diving into our story with uh, WSO2 products, let me give you a bit of an overview of uh, our company, what uh, we are doing. So with uh, 25 billion euro revenues in uh, 2017, we are the leader in the digital transformation of energy management and automation. So what does it mean? It means that we help our customers. We help our customers with three main things. We help them manage their efficiency better by optimizing their processes and the energy associated to it. We help them manage their energy supply better by integrating local production and also managing uh, energy uh, sourcing. And uh, we help them manage their grid better by uh, digitizing it. So as you can see, we are a big company with around 150,000 employees uh, in more than 100 countries. But still, we are a technology company. R&D is key for us, and we are investing 5% of our revenues into R&D, which is one of the highest of uh, our sectors. Uh, our businesses are well balanced across geography, around 27% in uh, North America, about the same in uh, Western Europe, 28% in uh, Asia Pacific, and 18% for the, for the rest of the world. So before explaining and talking about what EcoStructure is, uh, is about, I would like to give you a bit of uh, background uh, information. Uh, by 2050, will be 2.5 billion more people living in cities. So adding uh, more stress on infrastructures, on uh, transport, on uh, public services, on energy demand. So all that coupled with other uh, mega trends such as digitization with uh, more and more data and uh, connected uh, uh, devices and with uh, industrialization to support the, the rise of uh, emerging country will make that the energy demand will keep on growing. And at the same time, we need to reduce our carbon emissions. And this is where the challenge lies, because when you know that uh, to produce energy, more than 80% that the, the energy that is produced generates uh, has a carbon footprint, so mainly due to the fossil fuels we, we use to, to generate this energy. So to achieve that, we need to be more efficient. And we are looking at to be three times more efficient in, the, in our energy demand. And we are looking at doing that through digitization and IoT. So basically, uh, EcoStructure is an IoT-enabled, open, and interoperable architecture and platform. It allows us to uh, innovate following uh, current technology trends, such as uh, mobility, uh, cloud, sensing, analytics, and uh, cybersecurity. So we are uh, developing uh, and partnership, having some partnership and collaborating with partners and uh, developers on six uh, domains of expertise. You have them at the, at the bottom here, building, power, IT, machine, plant, and uh, grid. And EcoStructure is composed of three uh, layers uh, that can be both on cloud or on premise, apps, analytics, and services, edge control, and connected products. So connected products can be all sorts of products, uh, like uh, circuit breakers, uh, relays, sensors, UPSs, all that have uh, embedded uh, intelligence in them to uh, uh, make their operation uh, better and more efficient. Edge control is about end-to-end uh, -end, uh, solutions, keeping control, local control at the end, so that we uh, at the end, so we can uh, uh, guarantee uptime and uh, safety uh, for critical uh, products. And uh, apps, analytics, and services is about integrating hardware and software uh, together, gathering data for benchmarking, uh, simulation, uh, pattern recognition, so we can uh, have some early symptoms warning and all these uh, sort of things. So we are innovating in all these uh, three layers to uh, propose some end-to-end uh, -end, uh, solutions to four main uh, end markets that you have on top, buildings, uh, both residential and non-residential, data centers, uh, industry, and uh, infrastructure. So where do we fit in here? Our team is in the Schneider Digital Department, so really responsible for this uh, digitization. 
uh, in our mission, one of the first thing is that we are responsible to build an end-to-end -end digital architecture uh, that is scalable, reliable, and consistent. We also need to make sure that our customers have a great uh, digital experience. So we are working with uh, our uh, marketing team and uh, business teams uh, for that. We are also responsible of the rollout of uh, Schneider Digital Tools across uh, Schneider and also to create uh, value from uh, digital platform, uh, from data and from new uh, business models. So our story starts in 2015 where we, were, we decided to move from a solution-driven integration to a service-oriented uh, architecture. So the main uh, drivers for this move was first to have our customers uh, having a standardized uh, way to consume uh, services, and also to hide uh, the complexity uh, of uh, our source uh, system. So have a, an abstraction layer so that if uh, the backend uh, has a uh, an update, version change, new feature, or even if we replace completely the backend by a, a new one or several other ones, it could be uh, transparent for our consumers. Also leveraging from some usage control, being able to manage all the subscriptions at, uh, at one place and apply uh, quotas or limitations and uh, different type of policies and uh, also gather some, uh, some data, see exactly how uh, being able to observe where our flows, gather some uh, data and, uh, and analyze them. So to support our service-oriented architecture, we decided to use uh, APIs. So our key requirements were for uh, API publishers to be able to expose APIs easily, to be able to manage these APIs by applying some throttling, by uh, doing some versioning, some access control, and also monitor the usage of these uh, APIs. Then on the other side, for the application developers that want to use these APIs, we wanted to be them to be able, for instance, through a store, to be able to access documentation, discover these APIs, browse them, be able to subscribe, try them in different uh, environments, get some statistics on, on them, and, uh, and so on. Uh, in Schneider Electric, we have also a low-code development platform based on uh, our system, and it is key also that uh, the people developing applications quickly using this platform are able to use these uh, APIs easily. So using uh, exporting and re-importing uh, Swagger files uh, is also a good way that we are currently uh, using uh, to, to make uh, our application development uh, faster and the usage of APIs from, uh, from the applications. And last, for the applications uh, consuming uh, these APIs, being able to consume these APIs both in the internal, uh, on the internal network and uh, from a uh, public network and also be able to uh, monitor their, uh, their activity. So with our partner, THPS, Tori Harris uh, Business Solution, we uh, selected WSO2 API Manager as, as our uh, API Manager because it was uh, fulfilling all these uh, requirements, also because it was uh, open source and it was flexible in the way we could uh, deploy it on-prem or uh, in the cloud. So following that, to continue and support our API uh, real-time strategy, we decided to replace our legacy uh, integration solution by uh, WSO2 Enterprise uh, Integrator. So here again, we selected WSO2 Enterprise Integrator, uh, firstly because of the uh, clear, I would say, sustainable ESB roadmap they had, and also because of our good experience uh, with the WSO2 API manager, both on the product side and on the, the support side. So thanks to that, we're able to deliver APIs in a RESTful manner. At, uh, we, not, uh, we don't need to convert them from SOAP to REST as we had to at some point with our uh, legacy systems. And uh, we're able to have a stateless integration platform only keeping minimal data, uh, metadata, I would say, in the, in the platform and keeping all the business logic uh, outside of the uh, integration platform. So once we had selected this tool, a challenge was to make sure that all the applications were using the tools for the right uh, reasons. And uh, that's why 
we worked on uh, digital uh, standards. So these uh, integration standards, sorry. So we worked with these standards with a digital enterprise uh, team and also with the different uh, business uh, architects. And uh, it uh, enabled us to clearly speak the same language with all applications, define integration scenario, have a common understanding of what is synchronous, in synchronous, uh, unitary, bulk, and be able to select the proper tool to use based on these integration scenarios and uh, the context so that we know that applications uh, use the good tool for the good reason and the usage of our tool are consistent uh, across the, the company. So how did we uh, deploy our tool? Initially, we started deploying our WSO2 tools uh, in uh, Europe in a data center. And uh, to leverage from some cloud and Amazon features, we uh, moved uh, to uh, Amazon Web Services uh, Virtual Private Cloud. So it's still on our network. And so we deployed both uh, the API manager and the enterprise uh, integrators. Uh, integrator. So we have internal gateways and external gateways. Uh, internal gateways are for uh, internal uh, network usage, and external gateways have a subset of APIs uh, published on them. They are for uh, uh, to, to be accessible from uh, public, so on uh, DMZs. Uh, one thing that we did as well is that all the key uh, components, we have them in high availability uh, to make sure we have some uh, proper uh, availability in case of uh, maintenance and uh, things like that. So all the gateways, key manager, ESB, uh, message broker uh, are, uh, are doubled. We had more and more consumers coming from uh, US and calling uh, gateways in Europe was uh, adding time, was adding uh, latency. So our next step has been to deploy some API gateways in uh, North America, same way on the Amazon uh, Virtual Private Cloud. But we still kept the core component of the API manager uh, in Europe and uh, the, the key manager as well. This was a, a bit of a challenge for us because uh, with uh, the API manager version that we were using, we have uh, upgraded since then. Uh, every 15 minutes, we had to refresh uh, our cache, and uh, the uh, applications had to do a call to Europe uh, to the key manager. Uh, the gateways had to do a call to the key manager in Europe every 15 minutes to check that the application key was, uh, was still valid. So potentially, we're still adding this latency uh, at least, uh, uh, at worst, I would say, once every 15 minutes for each application. So now we've, done, uh, we've moved to API Manager 2.20. And so we can extend uh, uh, this, uh, this caching by itself and uh, uh, not be able to uh, not have this, uh, as many calls to Europe. One other option would also have uh, been to have a key manager directly in the US, but we haven't uh, followed this uh, path uh, for now. Uh, same way as we have the gateways in the uh, uh, US as close as possible to the consumer, we also deployed the enterprise integrator to be as close as possible to the different uh, source system and backends uh, we have. We have different uh, backends uh, in, uh, in the US, so to minimize the latency, we also deployed it in, in the US. And then we went to China. So we had also customers in, uh, in China, and so we deployed gateways in China, and this came also with a whole set of uh, challenges due to the specificities of, uh, of China. So the first one was the connection between China and Europe. Even if it's through our internal network, it is not as reliable as between US and Europe, and we couldn't rely on having only the key manager in, uh, in Europe. So basically, we uh, doubled it and have it uh, in China uh, as well, and we just uh, synchronize uh, uh, regularly the, the database. And also in China, we deployed our gateways in uh, Amazon VPC. But Amazon uh, AWS uh, service, Amazon Web Services is subcontracted in China, so it's another company, and we didn't get the same uh, services that we have elsewhere. So, for instance, for all the other part of the platform, we were using a feature from Amazon called RDS for the databases, and we couldn't uh, use it in China. So we had to have this uh, database uh, on, uh, let's say, uh, VMs and uh, have a local uh, uh, operating system uh, encryption. One thing that we are doing also with uh, China for the first time, so up to now it has been only our team developing uh, APIs, and we are looking at uh, empowering uh, the Schneider, the, our colleagues from uh, China, China to develop APIs uh, themselves and uh, publish them. 
So we'll be uh, leveraging from the API manager uh, multi-tenant feature that uh, we have now, that we have uh, upgraded our API manager. So this is uh, another step, and maybe they will have more and more team uh, publishing, uh, developing and publishing APIs uh, on our platform, still under uh, global uh, governance and uh, with the integration standards uh, helping. So this is uh, our uh, production environment. We have a similar pre-production environment and also test and dev environments that are a bit uh, smaller. Altogether, it makes more than uh, 80, 80 VMs, so it's quite, uh, quite a big, uh, big deployment. And uh, one other thing I, I, I forgot to mention, that we are looking at, uh, at uh, adding to make uh, life uh, easier and our platform work better. We're trying to we're looking at using the root 53 feature from Amazon. So basically, if you don't know about it, basically is that currently we have all our uh, gateways that have individual addresses to be reached. So each application that wants to connect a user API has to know the address of the gateway it wants to, to use. And with this root 53 feature, we can only have one address uh, for all the gateways. So basically, all applications will uh, uh, talk to this uh, address, and then uh, the root 53 feature from Amazon will automatically uh, reroute the call to the uh, gateway the closest to the caller. So it will mean that we will have uh, uh, automatically uh, people moving from countries to another will automatically uh, go to the uh, gateways that is uh, closer. At the same time, on our side, we'll have to make sure that we publish all the APIs on all the gateways, because potentially they, they can all be, uh, be reached. We are also sharing functional stats with our customer using Logs.io. So Logs.io, I don't know if you know about it, it's uh, ELK, Elasticsearch Kibana uh, software as a, as a service. So this is the end-to-end -end, uh, monitoring tool that we are using for log analysis at a company level. So it is a, a company uh, choice. And we are also pushing our WC2 logs uh, to Logs.io. So we can obviously uh, do some uh, log analysis, but also have alerts that are consistent with all the applications that are using Logs.io as well in our landscape. So alerts both uh, on our side for our own, uh, uh, let's say, management of our platform, but also uh, alerts that we are providing as a service to our consumers, maybe functional alerts on, uh, I don't know, error messages and, uh, and things like that, uh, emails and, and so on. We're also able to do some uh, custom dashboard with, uh, uh, based on the functional uh, logs, uh, the number of uh, errors, uh, the calls over time, mix and match different uh, parameters to really get uh, to our customers uh, the dashboards that they, they are after. And this is something that is helping us a lot because we had more and more consumers and uh, all uh, our applications were asking some statistics, some uh, weekly reports, and all this was done via email. This was really taking time out of the team. So now that we have that, we can just give them the, the dashboard and they have access to it. So keeping in mind, once again, this fits into some end-to-end -end monitoring uh, that uh, we do for the end-to-end -end flow. So it means that other applications part of the flow are also using uh, Logs.io. So we may have uh, some backends and some application also pushing logs uh, to uh, Logs.io. And we are able to aggregate everything in some uh, unique dashboard, which is uh, quite, uh, quite nice. Also on the uh, analytics and statistics uh, point of view, but more on the real time, on uh, the APIs, the runtime, and the uh, consumers, we have developed a custom dashboard to suit our need. This is done on WSO2. Uh, analytics. So we're using the uh, data database that is filled by the WSO2 analytic tool. And uh, with this dashboard, we are able to see first our overall metrics. So currently, you can see we have around uh, 272 APIs, 4 million calls per month, 170 consumers, and uh, 36 providers and 2.5 consumers per API. So this metric is quite interesting for us because we want to make sure that our APIs are getting uh, reused. So on the screen, you can see that uh, you can filter on the right on uh, regions uh, globally, but also China, US, and Europe, basically all of our regions. And also, you can uh, select a period of time uh, of your choice to get some uh, statistics on this period of time. So what you have uh, here are the different, uh, out of the 272 APIs, the APIs with the highest number of calls uh, for the period of time selected. and then. Uh, we can't see it in the screenshot, but below you have the list of uh, all the APIs. You'll see it a bit, a bit after in, a, in another screenshot. So the same thing as we can view APIs, we can view uh, from the customer, uh, consumer's perspective. So out of the 170 consumers, here are the 10 consumers 
that are consuming the most, uh, having the most API calls for the period of time that we have uh, selected. And then below, you have the list of all uh, of these consumers. So this, uh, this 117 several pages on the, the screenshot uh, is cutting the, the page. So let's look at the last one. I don't know if you can see. I'll go the other way around. It's uh, my, my Schneider app. And so let's deep dive in this application so that uh, we can show you a bit, uh, I can show you a bit uh, what it does and uh, how we are using uh, a, uh, our APIs. It will be, give you some, some concrete uh, use case. So the first thing when clicking on, the, on an application, you are brought to the page with the statistics of this consumer. So these are the number of API, API calls across, uh, across a day. And then you have the list of all uh, the APIs that have been uh, subscribed. So it has 23 APIs subscribed, so three pages. So these are the, the ones uh, that are, I think, the, um, had the most call in the period of time I, I selected. So let me give you a bit of an overview of uh, what this app does and how we are using these uh, APIs. So my Schneider app, we have around 30,000 individual uh, users per month using this app, mainly uh, distributors, partners, and Schneider employees, but also more and more uh, end, uh, end users. And uh, the goal of this application is to have inside of one application natively a lot of things that normally user would have to go through different websites to do. So order management, uh, support, uh, partnership uh, management, uh, uh, product catalog, and, and so on. So this app is global. It has been translated in uh, 36 uh, languages. And uh, it has, the, as I told you, different user profiles uh, like uh, distributors and partners. So every uh, user will get a different experience on the application depending on uh, its user profile and the country it's using it. So basically, the app will display what the user needs. And the app is entirely, entirely based on API. So there's barely no data stored in, uh, in the app. And all is done uh, using, uh, using APIs. So for instance, uh, distributors or partners, they can follow their order, can visualize their order. So they will get the same experience on the application, but on the background, it will call a different application for the uh, API for the partner, and it will call a different API for uh, the uh, distributor. So for the distributor, for instance, it will be the MySC order uh, API, uh, the third uh, from, uh, from the top. Users can also create assets from this application. So assets are the information of a product that has been bought and the location where it has been installed. So it gives us uh, the opportunity to know our install base and uh, then uh, be able to propose some warranty, some uh, maintenance services, but also uh, contact our customers if there's some uh, maintenance or whatever thing uh, required. So to do that, they will use the uh, IR uh, asset API. Same as the IR asset on screen, we can see a PRM profile and a PRM invoice. There are uh, APIs for partnership management. So from the APIs, from the application, from my Schneider app, the, uh, our customers can register to the partnership uh, program and then uh, get some reward points. They can take a picture of an invoice and uh, send it to the partnership reward program and get some points. So this will use the PRM invoice uh, API in the, background, in the background, and then they can get some, some gift and, and things uh, like that. Also for the support, uh, our customers can use BFO MyCase to create case directly from the application, so no need to call the support center. They can use the BFO uh, MyCase uh, API, I mean use the app that will use the BFO MyCase uh, API in the, in the background. So same way as uh, we had the information of uh, my Schneider app as a consumer and all uh, the API it's using, we can click on an API like the BFO MyCase one and we get the information about the usage of this particular API over time. So the number of uh, calls this API has had across all its uh, consumers for the period of time selected. And then uh, the list of the different uh, consumers uh, using this uh, application. So you can see that uh, my uh, Schneider app is, uh, is uh, one of them. So I, I hope this gave you a bit of a, of a view of what uh, we are doing, uh, how, uh, why we selected WSO2 and uh, how we are using it. I think we have a bit of time if for uh, some questions, if, uh, if you have any. No questions? Oh, okay.
Hello, thank you. Um, I saw in your previous slide that some of your calls were lasting more than four seconds, for example. Yeah. Um, so how did you dimension the, the API gateway so that uh, we have enough context, enough sessions um, to support the, those four blocked seconds? Sorry, can you repeat? Um, so you, you, were, you were blocking a session for four seconds, right? Yes. And uh, what was your approach to dimension the API gateway? So I think, yeah, so this uh, from the statistics you show on the, on the dashboard, yeah. So I think it all depends on, on the context. I mean, uh, uh, usually we do some performance testing and uh, our gateways uh, add uh, minimal time. Here in this case, this is, let's say, a maximum. This, this could have been a network issue or a problem in, uh, in, in the back end that make uh, this time that that is the cause of this time. So when we see these kind of things, uh, we uh, investigate uh, for the reason. It doesn't mean that all uh, our call uh, take, uh, take this time. 